This is a conversation with Dan O'Mara, who is a founder and the COO of Circuit Launch and Mech Labs. Circuit Launch is a space for hardware entrepreneurs in Oakland, California, and Mech Labs is a project based course for robotics education. What does a robotics education look like to you? Dan jokes during the interview that if you're at a university, that you need to major in electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, and computer science to get a robotics education. Some universities do have a dedicated robotics program, but it's a big commitment, both in terms of time and money. And what if you already have a degree, even in engineering? Should you go back to school? I have friends and family considering this question. And I feel like there's a gap here, where a group of would-be roboticists don't know how to get started, and this seems to be one of the spots where MechLab fits well. I also find it interesting that MechLabs basically does the opposite of what universities do on several levels, as you'll see during this interview, and that doing so has worked well for them. They are, as Dan says during the interview, creating a program that they wanted to learn from. I'm Audra Nash. This is the Sense Think Act podcast. Thank you to our founding sponsor, Open Robotics. And now, Here's my conversation with Dan O'Mara. Hi, Dan. Would you introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Dan O'Mara, uh, the COO of Circuit Launch and Mech Labs. We are a, um, a basically a community space for robotics and hardware engineering, um, with working shared labs as well as a educational program for mechatronics. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about both of those things. Uh, let's start with Circuit Launch. Would you tell me okay. kind of the story of Circuit Launch, how it's come to what it is? Sure. I think Circuit Launch grew up in the Bay Area here as a um, a space coming off the the tail end of like the the fall of Tech Shop and the understanding of like that there were all of these entrepreneurs and people in this area who were doing hardware and electronics and robotics and. Like this is the Bay Area. We don't have space to do that. Where you can run a business like this, kind of in your garage, in a lot of other places, but eventually you do need some type of space to build things in a workshop and lab tools and all of the that that stuff. And we just realized that there are all these entrepreneurs who are doing, you know, new companies like because of the the start of Kickstarter and all of the great robotics technologies that are starting to become a lot more available. And we need, you know, they need space, they need shared labs, they need facilities, they need um, that. And you, you, you know, I make a, a joke that, you know, we're not WeWork, we don't have, you know, we don't provide scented candles with your, uh, your membership here. <laughs> yeah. uh, we're, we're a little messy chic, we, you know, but, you know, one of the things that really resonated on our, our marketing language and website is like, you know, uh, you know, do you want to put a soldering iron on your desk? come work here. Like this is where we, you know, we want you who are building stuff, making stuff, doing that. I mean, we have, we have one person right now who has a metal lathe that he snuck onto his desk basically. And wow. so in the upstairs area. So like the, we, we realized that there is such a, uh, a need for um, like a community and a place where you can work and you can share with other roboticists and other electronics uh, hardware specialists and, and, and everything and build a business. And so that's what we really focused on. We said entrepreneurs who are building hardware and robotics businesses, we want to have a space for them and we want to make this work. And so that was the original side of it. Um, we partnered with our building owner, which is also another crucial part of our business model to be able to provide that space and to be able to, to make that so that we weren't going to just grow big. And then all of a sudden the building owner, you know, creates a, a lease situation where we couldn't. And it was, mm -hmm. it was a wonderful match made in heaven. We found an incredible business uh, building for about 32,000 square feet. And we started building our community from just a few people. And we used to let you know, any kind of company come in. And now we're uh, over 95% uh, specifically wow. hardware or robotics, not even like, like we used to do like, oh, you know, if you're a lawyer that works in the patent space, you can come here. If you're, uh, you know, if you do some software, somewhat something, you could come in like there. And now it's just really our community has become um, all about robotics, which is mm -hmm. great. That's really what we're we're, uh, we're, we're creating and fostering and now people want to build their companies from marine robotics to, you know, uh, IOT devices to, you know, car, the, we, we have a, 
uh, company that just won the the uh, Department of Energy uh, e-robot prize. Uh, friendly robots, they're a, a carpet cleaning robot. So it's just all of these these people came and you know we, we built it and they came and that's really the kind of the story and we've we've been constantly working with um startups to be like give them what they need which is sometimes the ability to have a desk sometimes the ability to expand into an office and then sometimes it's the ability to go bankrupt and have all of your employees start new businesses and new companies and go into little other places and downsize uh, things. So that flexible space was what we really knew that our community needed and then market tested it. And, and now we have a, a really flourishing, um, awesome community that, that we're leveraging to, to create a, you know, an education program on top of and get more people um, robotics experience and projects and mentorship and everything else. Mm -hmm. It's awesome that it's 95% occupancy. Um, well, we're hundred percent occupied, just 95% robotics, 95% <laughs> and, robotics uh, and uh, hardware. Yeah. That's so exciting. Yeah. Cause I was there, um, with Haloti, mm -hmm. um, two, three summers ago as yep. an intern for them. And mm -hmm. it was really wonderful to be in the space. Um, like I loved all the robotics that was going on around and I think, I, I don't remember numbers, but it was, it didn't I don't think we were, I don't think it was a hundred percent occupied, um, two or three years ago. No, uh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Gosh. And I, we just went to the block party or you just had the block party and it was wonderful yep. to see the turnout for that. The robot block party. Yep. Mm -hmm. The barbecue. Yeah, we do that everything. every we're now that's our second one in six months. Our second one, this, you know, in a year. So we've done. We're hope, planning to do those every six months, and it's been. Now we had forty different robotics companies and vendors and and demoers uh, mm -hmm. all come out and with the job fair and everything. It was a really fun event. Yeah, so I mean, from my perspective, it kind of seems like it's part co-working space and then part maker space with like laser printers mm -hmm. and CNC machines and I don't know all these things. Um, yeah. And then the focus on community. So that, uh, like, from our marketing side of point, we're trying to kind of, in, in many ways, kill off those two terms, co-working ah. and robot and makerspace. And it, it's interesting because that that's really about where we're like. So the, the co-working side, obviously, we're shared offices. You can rent desks and offices. That I mean, it's co-working. Yeah. But, you know, co-working really kind of doesn't, explain the fact that you have great labs and tools and 3d printers and you know an electronics bench and a soldering bench and that you can you know if you want to put a 3d printer on your your dedicated desk you know you can put a 3d printer on your dedicated desk and run it all night long right mm -hmm. um all of that and so that's really why we you know co-working is very much the sense of like uh eh, that's a dead business because of we work right and so we want to you mean there's no we're, more we're, potential for a company exactly. to start there because we work's kind uh, of monopolized that well, not even monopolized, but just that, you know, people aren't interested in the, like, co-working has a bad rap because it, uh, I mean, from an investment pro profile and everything uh. else, right? And we're so much more than that. Like, you, we don't want to be pigeonholed into the idea of just, like, you know, you're, you're, we're all working together. It's like we have a full lab and facilities and we want to, you know, in a community there, which is so much more valuable. The yeah. makerspace side of it, another business that is kind of doomed to fail for most most people's minds, right? Especially after Tech Shop, right? I don't know Tech Shop. Oh, okay. So <laughs> Tech Shop was, um, and that's partly because you, the the space you're in fits more with what we're doing. Like we we don't want to be a makerspace. We want to be uh, an on uh, a shared fab lab. Like mm -hmm. intellect. It's all, mainly the the difference is the level of entrepreneurs and robotics mm -hmm. companies rather than hobbyists and makers. Right. Yeah. And not to say that we don't want makers and hobbyists. We were happy to take them. But we also realize that we want we want people, cutting edge industry professionals in our space and doing mm. that. Right. Um, and so Tech Shop was kind of the first big maker space. Like, mm. I mean, Make in Magazine, they all kind of evolved with Tech Shop to be, you know, one of the largest, most well-known maker spaces, you know, in the world. And Tech Shop grew on this very unsustainable model um, and then they made a lot of mistakes and obviously we don't want to go into that but they went bankrupt 
And then yeah. all of these makers and professionals and entrepreneurs who, who, who realized, hey, shared laboratories and shared resources is a, is a good thing and an economically viable thing for my business. And now I don't have that anymore. Right? Oh, totally. Yeah. So, but, um, so what we, and part of what tech shops issues were is, is they didn't uh, support their entrepreneurs enough. They supported their hobbies mm. and makers, but the problem with that is, is that there is a limited amount of, of money you can make off of a hobbyist because there are always going to be, you know, where an entrepreneur is somebody who can be able to support a community and be able to invest in new tools and have mm -hmm. all of those things and it creates and then build larger office, you know, in, be in bigger offices and support a space because that, you know, having monthly memberships of just a, of a small amount can, can't, it, it can be hard to run an industrial space with all of these resources on where so having those, those places for entrepreneurs. And that's where we realize it's like, um, if we point ourselves towards the helping entrepreneurs and helping small businesses go from like a small desk all the way up to a larger office and help them, you know, introduce them into networking and funding and all of these things. Like, I think we're, we're a little bit more akin to an incubator than we are a makerspace, except oh. we don't take, we don't take that, percentage of equity from anybody. We just want people to pay for space and join our community. And then mm -hmm. that in itself um, has so many dividends. Definitely. Very interesting. Yeah, I've been, so I've gone to a ton of maker spaces because I find them quite mm -hmm. useful. Like just oh, yeah. trying to be involved with hardware. Um, and I often see they're incredibly underfunded. They're lacking mm -hmm. kind of like the really knowledgeable people like they'll get yeah. burned out because they're helping everyone yeah. and then they end up leaving yeah. um and then often because of maybe the the weird funding situation they're very political often mm -hmm. which is, it's kind of like stepping into a toxic environment and i just wanted to use a 3d printer this kind of thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it, it it is hard we found that um you know, we love our maker community. Don't get mm -hmm. me wrong. I don't want to say anything bad about the makers and the hobbyists who come and use oh, our space. Wonderful. But entrepreneurs are a lot ha more hands off. Like I don't have to teach the most basic, uh, like everyone, mm. we, when you, when we focus on entrepreneurs and robotics companies, everyone is an expert in something. Right. Mm -hmm. And this will even come back to when we are, when we're talking about education side of things, right? Because it's very much a peer, um, we, we, a, a peer learning system as well. Yeah. And that if everyone's coming as a, an expert in something, they've learned how to learn. Right. And the same thing with the space hmm. where if people are coming in, they have a, a large expertise in this one thing. They probably, they don't know how to do all this other stuff, but the fact that they can learn it and do it well is something that is, is very likely. And they don't, you don't have to do a lot of hand holding, Right. Where I find that um, with some of the maker spaces, particularly tech shop, I found that they they had the their their staff were called dream coaches, right? <laughs> but they were minimum wage people who maybe learned how to use the machines a day before everyone else, right? Mm. And and the amount of help that ever, all of the members needed on all of the machines and how to do things and all of that stuff that wasn't part of their business model. That was just supply as your membership for free in their understaffed people, right? So yeah. it becomes really hard to run a space when you are educating every single person. The best maker spaces I found are, they do have ways like where you say are very community or very like, like politics side because the community has to provide that. Yes, right? not you know, the You have to have the volunteers person. and not the maker space people, but you have to create the community that does that. In many ways, we've, we've done that to a large degree because then that, um, you know, but it's no longer how to use the laser cutter. It's how to get your batteries certified for shipping, how to get FCC certified <laughs> for yeah. your thing. And that's where, you know, if we had created a space that was kind of like maker spaces for that, you know, it's a lot to, to lead handhold every single person through. Mm -hmm. and so that, that, you know, I'm, I'm just continually impressed by our community of just how high a level they are. And then because of that, they understand what it means to have a shared facility. And, you know, it doesn't mean that we still don't get messes and issues in politics and all of oh, that. Oh, of course. But, yeah. But it's Any group that, of people. Um, you know, it's when, when a community is of a community of experts and everyone is kind of doing things that and learning to, to level up their businesses and their self and then 
um, being in that community doing together, the, sh the, the ability to share that is incredible. Right? Mm -hmm. And where, you know, the best maker spaces do that with the hobbyist level, too, is, is that yep. it, they get their, their members to help other members. And it's not expected to be like management um, teaches you everything. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Let's see. So, that, I mean, it's, it's a very interesting. I really like the model. How did you how did you come to this model of um, like so co-working has its perks, but it's kind of saturated by Upwork or it's like hard to improve upon that. Um, and then makerspaces have their kind of business model level issues. How did you mm -hmm. come to this idea of targeting people, not, not targeting people, but like focusing on entrepreneurs as opposed, like how, how did you come on the business model that we've just kind of described? Well, that from the very beginning, like we, we all saw what tech shop was doing and knew that we wanted something more. Because yeah. they didn't, they didn't serve the entrepreneurial like makerspaces don't serve entrepreneurs very well, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's like, well, it's got everybody's got to have some time on the tool. Well, sometimes an entrepreneur needs all the time on your tools, right? Yes, and you have to be able to provide some of that that ability of ways to to work that out. And so we, from the very beginning, we were like, well, you know. I'm involved in hardware. One of our founders was involved in hardware, and like this is this is what we do and what we need. And so we were like, well, there are other people who are there. This is what a good space like this would be great because we were like, also, let's use the resource of from the building owner having this space. And so we built this all out from the carpets to the drop ceiling and everything, and saying it's like you need to have space and you need to be able to um, have that customer group and find that niche. And that's where we really, we saw that this niche um, was underserved. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we took a big bet that this would be, that there would be enough people here. And now, you know, it's like we have a waiting list for most of our, that's our wonderful. And tables. And I'm happy to hear that. It's, it's wonderful for, for that. And we want to expand and we're, you know, we are, currently looking for for more funding for our, our round as well and we're looking to mm. put more circuit launches out there and specifically the the tie-in to education was is that after we built this community people were like well how did everyone here learn how to do robotics yeah right like <laughs> i want to do this how do i do this and we're like uh go to school maybe yeah, and they're like, well, but but that they're not teaching robotics. They're just they're you know, I what degree do I get? We're like, well, you should go get an uh, you should go get a computer science degree, a uh, mechanical engineering degree, and an electrical <laughs> engineering degree. <laughs> yeah, um, as all well of as learn things. business if you want to do a start. And you should learn business too. Marketing. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. And, and like maybe that, some There's not enough time in the world to be able to learn all those things. So we mm. we said. We were like, okay, we need a mechatronics education program that immediately gets people using the latest technology and the latest things and, and building robots is the yeah. first thing. You know? And from a very pragmatic perspective too, like this is one of the things about having entrepreneurs in it. Like they probably mm -hmm. won't be wasting your time because they are, they have skin in the game and their money is slowly depleting and this kind mm -hmm. of thing while they're trying to get interest and grow. Um, yeah. like time is of the essence for them. So they're going to do whatever is most pragmatic for them. Well, that, that was actually the model that like led us to this type of learning, right? Ah. But entrepreneurs are not necessarily our target market on, for the learning course, for the learning side of it. it was because most of, most entrepreneurs are too, like there's, there's a couple of things on there. They're too busy to do the, the thing. Like they can only focus on the thing that they need. Yeah. The next step. Right? Yep. You know, so unless there's some type of immediate coaching or whatever that they need, um, then the business model really is as if you need that type of design, like good design services and prototyping services, mm -hmm. get them connected with other people in the network, right? But there's a whole group, if you want to work in robotics and you don't have a job and you're not willing to like be the entrepreneur, like yep. I want to work for a company or I want to build a robot. You know, or I want to learn to get better in my job or upskill or do those things. There's mm -hmm. all of those people. And that's kind of our market for Mech Labs, which is gotcha. really that's our education program. Mech Labs. Yeah. It sounds like so when you focus on the entrepreneurs from the perspective of circuit launch, it seems like it's a it's a bit of an exclusive community where you come in and you're an mm -hmm. entrepreneur and you 
um, are highly skilled in at least one thing and you're good at learning and you're pragmatic and you can pay the bills to occupy desk space. And so that's a mm -hmm. good business model for circuit launch, but yeah. being kind of exclusionary, um, now it's like, how do we get the other people in a position where they might go into this? And that's the education program. Yeah. You got it. Gotcha. I really like that. Yeah. And then the benefit is, is that we are filled in a community of mentors. Right? Yep. All of those entrepreneurs are, you know, they're in the community, they've done it, they are, they're on the bleeding edge of technology and doing cool stuff, right? Yeah. So it's very easy to find someone who has a lot of skill and, and expertise to come in and help people and become mentors in a lot of this stuff huh. and to be able to get answers from too. For sure. Like if I have this very hard problem, now we've created this community that, that serves everyone and they've been serving each other a lot and now it's being able to also serve the you know the students that want to come in and be able to learn how to do this as well yeah how do you incentivize entrepreneurs to be mentors for this because you were saying they're very busy mm -hmm. and um i just imagine that's a challenge or maybe you pay them or maybe it's part of the like you get uh, your desk at half off or something like this if you're a I mentor mean, there, there's obviously incentives to to be mentor <laughs> Yeah. Um, I think that in general, you know, so yes, we do pay our mentors that come in, but we have a very different model. Like we're not looking for instructors. Hmm. That's the, the big difference with our education program. And um, Mac Labs is a build it to learn it program. It, What's it the is difference built... to you? Sure. So the Mac Labs, the build it to learn it program, the idea is, is that you come in and you build a project. Mm -hmm. If you want to learn Ross, you either pick a project that has Ross in it, or you join a team project that has Ross in it, right? Mm -hmm. And then you build it. And then as you go along, you're, you, you are either individually or in a team responsible for figuring out how to implement Ross. Mm -hmm. And so there's the, the side of that is, is that then what happens when you get stuck, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's why you join a program. Traditionally, People just say, well, we're just going to teach you everything you could possibly need to know in an A to Z way, yep. and we're going to start at A. And it doesn't matter if you're on B or C, and you need you need D, and other people need F. Like, it doesn't matter. You're just all going to sit around and wait till you found the information, get taught to you, mm -hmm. and, or in a book in, in this, this process, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what an instructor does, right? They have a curriculum. So we say no lectures, no textbooks, no curriculum. Mm -hmm. We say what will happen is, is the way you're going to learn this, you're on D, someone else is on F, and then this is where, remember when I made the tie that everyone is an expert yeah. in something? People, all people are that way. We are all human beings. We are all experts in something. We've all done something cool and can share that. So mm -hmm. that's when you get the peer learning. So then people come into our program that when they get stuck, they then have an entire team of people who all have a ton of expertise in a lot of things mm. that are in the program and can share their expertise. Mm. And, and we have, you know, for people who are like for really deep problems, this is where we can go to like our community of like of experts that are working on really cutting edge, tech, edge technology and much more deeper technical stuff that is there. And then we ask them, then when they mentor, we're not asking them to build a curriculum. Not, they don't need a prep PowerPoint presentation. Talk, probably. They don't need, they just come and help. Yep. Right. Come for a few hours. Look at the code. On this be thing. like, ah, this is the wrong thing. Exactly. And so uh. they need zero preparation. Their effort and their time commitment becomes a lot more useful. Mm. Right. And the, and then of course, mentors are what they really like when you're mentoring, especially in Silicon Valley that word means like giving back because of all the, all the mentors and all the people that you received. You, yeah. Right. Um, that's not to say we don't pay our mentors for that, but it is, um, a, you know, it's ex expected that this is a, a community. We're all giving back. And then the best part is you get to work with really bright upcoming roboticists that you mm -hmm. can hire for your company. <laughs> yeah. Right. And that's a really <laughs> cool thing when you can say, Oh, wow. This guy is, you know, he's a Python genius, but he's never done an embedded software, mm -hmm. right? Hmm. I bet I could help him a little bit along and then jump him in and he could help my company, uh, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. So that's where this, 
the, it, when you're all thinking about the ecosystem is what we're building. We're, we're building an ecosystem of entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and the way to become entrepreneurs, the way to become employees of companies that yep. are, are good and, and to accelerate your career gotcha. and close that loop. Because what we've seen, you know, we, one of um, our companies that are here is uh, Silicon Valley Robotics. They're an industry uh, organization. And you, you probably know that Andra and all of that. And they, they're amazing. And they've been talking to a lot of the, the all of the, the companies that are in robotics, which unfortunately all kind of are very siloed when they're not in a community. So it can be very mm -hmm. hard to know what they need, and then it can be hard for them to, to say, well, what they need for from employees, right? Yeah. And what what they're finding is is that most of their their applicants are mechanical engineers, right? But what they really need is some is more, and they keep hiring computer science degrees. They're computer. They're they're doing hiring programmers who have somewhere along the way figured out hardware, mm. right? And so there's there's a real disconnect of what you can learn in school and how you can prepare for a job in robotics and actually mm. get the experience and the portfolio and the hands-on uh, of all of that. I mean, it, that's that's been a real change in what we've seen in, in people looking in robotics to um, accelerate their skills and to get jobs and to be able to, to learn these things is that there's a disconnect from what industry needs and what traditional education is teaching and we want to bridge that gap. We want mm -hmm. people leaving our programs being like, hey, I built the, the you know, I integrated the Robotus SDK for these servos into a ROS node. And now this whole robot is made with ROS. Yeah. Right? And that's my portfolio. And so you apply to a job that's like, you know, needs ROS experience, right? Everybody says, I need ROS experience. That's on every little thing. But how do you get Ross experience what is without yeah. building a robot and not just a you know a turtle bot right we need you need to to get deeper into some of this Ross language and and on different things to be able to really be useful on that and so that's where there's there's really like there are some great programs out there but the hands-on component is is what's missing and so we want people leaving with literally the like this is what I built. Here's a tutorial that I wrote. Here's my GitHub that shows yep. what the code that I did. And there's me instead of just a resume that says I know some ROS, right? And, yep. and then no one knows what that is. And that that provides people who are, are looking for jobs um, a, a killer way to get into the, the industry. Definitely. Yeah, I, I can think. So I've done some hiring while at Open Robotics. And it is funny because it's like the first thing that I go to, it's not like I, I could care less about the resume. And this is just my yeah. approach to it. Um, but yeah. go right to the GitHub and then look at yeah. kind of what they've done and try to sauce out what their commits are and how much of it was just like, like what they understand yeah. from how they're doing it. And that's really nice to be training people in very pragmatic ways on an actual project. I really like that yeah. approach. And then they get to learn like, well, how to use GitHub for a, for hardware? Yeah, <laughs> that's that's not an easy thing right there, right? <laughs> and uh, and how all of those things. And then we you know we ask people to like one of the the minimum requirements every single week. Everyone has to write a tutorial, and so huh. they start learning good communication skills and uh, demonstration huh. documentation skills and all of that that we want to help them demonstrate. Yeah, um, let's see. That's really interesting. Uh, one thing. So this robot behind you. Um, yeah. I'd like to introduce that robot. It was one built sure. in a project by uh, some students that went through this, correct? Yep. So this is Ricci. It's uh, based on an open source robot uh, robotics um, platform uh, that was developed by Pollen Robotics. They, uh, they actually sell the robot, but they completely open source the designs. So we were the first group outside of the developers to actually build a fully working robot or off of Ricci, right? So we originally, um, so the there's a lot of, it's kind of grown as we've gone, but we started with the torso and the head and, and one arm. And in 12 weeks, we went from not knowing anything about this robot to fully functional uh, working robot, mm -hmm. which was amazing. Like, and these are students, this is not like, you know, some of them had, very little robotics experience, and some of them had a little bit more. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, so in 12 weeks to build something, that was incredible. Uh, our second session with, with Ricci, um, everyone wanted to work on the software side as the platform. Mm -hmm. um, I had, of course, I bought all the, the, the motors for the, the extra arm, and everybody wasn't interested in doing the arm that group. <laughs> Okay. Which is it's fine. That's our program. If you don't like you get to, to work on the things that you want to work on. It's a match, yeah. Not the things you it's not a it's not like that horrible group project you you got in school where you're like, <laughs> Okay, this is the thing you gotta do. There's one person who's good at it, let's just make him do it. Right? Yeah. Like that's not what our program is. Ours okay. is very much like you might be a Python, you know, a whiz. But you want to work on motor control systems in the power, you know, in power delivery and 3D printing and CAD. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. You provide your, your expertise to the rest of the students wanting to learn Python. Mm -hmm. And then the other people who have a lot more experience, the MEs that are just graduating, they, they have a lot more experience in some of the, you know, the CAD and all of that. So that's how, how that gets trained. Mm -hmm. um, but so our second session, um, I built the arm because nobody wanted to do it and we needed it. Um, and so, uh, but everybody else, they did, they created, they put it on ROS. It was on this thing called Luos, which was kind of a semi open source, not like it was an odd thing. I've never heard of it. That, uh, that Paul and had choice. Yeah, it's, it was a, like a distributed microcontroller system that, huh. you know, has a lot of potential, but. Um, because no one in the world could get the microcontrollers but <laughs> Pollen, yeah. we were like, well, let's you know, let's put this on ROS and like use the Dynamics old yeah. control system. Like that, that's that, great. That, that that seems like to be a good thing. And so we we put them over that, put them on a mobile base, and then he became a concierge robot and he actually walked around, told jokes, and gave tours and told told people in the pandemic if they weren't wearing masks that they oh, needed wow. to put a mask on. How funny. So that was the second. The third session we did, again, Ricci as the platform, uh, became all a very deep object orientation and grasping technology like work. Oh. So they they rewrote a lot of the control systems for for the the motors, um, integrated it all through ROS, worked with April tags, and you know, uh, cool. you know, creating a, a, a computer vision and, and learning how to be able to grab a block and we we set it up so that you know if you picked up the block the robot grabbed it and put it back where it was cool oh, and, yeah. and so that's kind of their their session and so that was a smaller session of of teams yeah so and there's a lot it, it became an amazing too. platform that's awesome yep i like and it and it's all open source we we publish all of our stuff and all of the thing and so people who are interested in doing it and that's a really important component that we found out for our program was the open source um, part our the open source part. Huh. So we first started as, you know, we're, we're growing and building this as we go and figure out what we wanted. Our very first pilot was to build, to take a, a already existing coffee robot that was working. It's a little bit, you've seen yep. our coffee robot. Definitely, but I've it's had a, coffee it, from it. It's basically a, the three axis palletizing two arms that grab cups and things and then put it up to a, a big super automatic espresso machine and then delivers the cup, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and it's all done on ROS, but it was done developed by a couple of crazy Russian developers that are, are awesome. They were they were interesting, <laughs> um, it, but it it, it had, needed a lot of work for mm. for design. And so the person who owned it wanted us to um, upgrade it and go there. And we found that trying to get students to one manage client expectations uh, and too much be in, in a little like and understanding what they really needed and all of that, it ended up becoming really, dead. and then reverse engineering something is often much harder than just building it the first time. Oh, I'm sure. Right. And so that's something that I think we've all learned as you go along, but at, at the beginning, it can be very like enticing to be like, well, I have this thing, I could just improve it. Right. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's really just better to kind of go back to the to start board. over. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so that was our very first session. We found that having it and having it closed like we couldn't publish any of our work and so mm. um ever since then we were like no no no, open source all way the way go. like all of our projects all of the things need to be um like publishable because then you can manage like you benefit from a community of people most of the time that are working on the open source group um you know documentation is always hit or miss with all pro projects but particularly Almost open source miss. that at least at least they have more information out there than something oh, that's totally. closed, right? 
yep. right? And so you can look at the code. You're not doing as much reverse engineering. You can look at the code. You can you know download examples. You can work on that. Yep. Um, and then you you have a place to be able to. You, it's like you know that something at least somebody has done something. It's worked. Right. And you can get an idea so of the community around it too. So you can yep. see if it's supported or not, or like will yep. other people. And have we did this, this problem? with no community. Like yeah. Richie had zero community at first. And so now we get tons of, of requests all the time. Be like, hey, how did you do this? Or how, Super how cool. did, you know, we want to make this too. And so we can then contribute to the community. And then mm. the benefit for that is, is then all of the students learn to, you know, do better documentation and how to better, you know, support an open source and, and how to work in a community of people and how to do project management and all of the soft of skills. skills and kind of important things that you need to know <laughs> for running and being a roboticist you oh, know, yeah. company, right? Um, for sure. All of that is, is available in the, you know, the in-between building stuff. Uh huh. And also, I mean, it's all like these skills are also just very valuable in general if you want to do anything. So teaching yeah. them how to do that, like, I mean, I use Git every day. Um, yeah. And so like learning how to work with people on that and get feedback and implement the feedback and this kind of thing, very valuable. Yeah. So that's so cool that you're exposing them to all of that. Huh. Let's see. So you, you mentioned that they do tutorials for mm -hmm. this. Uh, actually, before that, um, how, do you, how do you scope a project? Like, how, how do you decide Ricci, um, making it so Ricci grab, looks at a fiducial marker, grabs a block, moves it somewhere? Like, how, how do you pick a scope? How do you make it not too hard or not too easy, um, given the students that you're working with? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of been the interesting thing was when we had a really, like, scoped out project, mm -hmm. um, we found that we often had tr more trouble with that and reaching those goals and figuring out what, what could be happening, what couldn't happen than we do in our current system. So currently what we try to do an overarching project idea, um, whether, you know, some of the things on the blocks right now is, is like, we'd like to do, you know, one of the, you know, millions or, or improve on the, the millions of uh, open source quadrupeds out there. We'd like to, that's one of our ideas. We'd like to do cool. um, some more, uh, you know, uh, like autonomous driving cars and tracks and like the RC car kind of thing. Like those are some of the ones we'd like to do. Um, we'd like to, uh, we have a Boston Dynamics spot. We'd like to put him on Ross. That's another one. But mm -hmm. so there's a perfect example of, you know, We'd like to do the Ross, but we'd actually like to, you know, we need to choose a project that one will appeal to a bunch of people who are, are there. So you have, like, we have to make it fun and interesting and exciting, right? Um, so it's like if, if our courses are, um, you know, learn inverse kinematics, we will get a small percentage of people, right? Mm -hmm. However, if we can be like, you know, build your own um, juggling robot. Right. It sounds incredibly <laughs> hard. Yeah. It's it incredibly awesome. hard. But, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you put that out there as you think. And then as you, so let's take that as an example. Like we're going to do a juggling robot, right? Okay. So we, we have to, one, make sure that we have the budget and know what, you know, what kind of actuators we're going to need, what kind of things to be able to even capable do that. And then um, we put, the, like, maybe that's where we start, right? Mm -hmm. And say, okay. We were going to build a juggling robot and then like all robots and all companies and everything that you do, you have to say, okay, well, we're going to have to learn a ton along the way and then we're going to change the scope as at where we go uh -huh. based on what we have and where we need to, to be. Um, so maybe that robot in the end is only throwing a ball up and catching it, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, maybe we get two hands to do that or there, but it's the <laughs> beginnings of like, it's juggling. You know, you know, maybe the next session picks it up where we left off. Yeah. Right. And then says, okay, now we want two balls, and then we need to be able to have a vision system for tracking, and we need to be able to do that. And then you implement that, and so the the project becomes, you know, make a juggling robot several sessions, and you make more progress on that. Gotcha. And then part of it is is to like, like we don't, you know, unlike a business where you say, okay. I'm going to go hire the most capable people I can find to do these very particular jobs. We have the opposite problem. We want the most capable people in different things not doing what they're good at. 
Yeah. Because <laughs> unless they want to do that. Like yeah. if people really, they're like, they're really good at this and they just want to get better at it. Great. That we'll, we'll have you too. Perfect. Yeah. But, um, and we get a, a bunch of that, but in general, like we want, if you're really good at something, you know, you're probably needing to know some other things and wanting to learn those things. So let's totally. get you focused on that. You can help the other people who are not as good at these things with their Python, if you're a Python coder, or you know, if you're a mechanical engineer, they're your CAD. Like, there's such Whatever great traits. You yeah. Know, right? um, and so the scope really happens based on like who needs who needs to do what. And if we lock ourselves to the like, well, we must get this end product done. Yeah. Right. Then it isn't as efficient for for everybody. Like, I, we want to hit our goals, but we're not afraid of also changing where that scope is. To say, you know, so that it is achievable and that you can then learn the things you learn, which is way more important than getting the end result. Yeah. But, and so we do sometimes rescope a project. Makes um, sense. It's like the juggling robot on, is a great example. Yeah. Yeah. A juggling robot would, you know, maybe it's not a three ball juggling robot that's doing this, but, you know, we've developed, you know, one ball and developed the beginnings of a vision system that can track those balls and mm -hmm. catch it on another side. And then the next, and then it gets bigger and better um, as you go along. And it's, it's more interesting that way too. Definitely. And also really nice for people learning yeah. um, and also seeing what's possible and this kind of thing. Like you say juggling robot and it's like, oh, that sounds incredibly difficult, but it's like throwing a yeah. ball up and down, just one, still difficult, yeah. but not like incredibly infeasible. And then like yeah. maybe you go from one arm to the other and this yeah. kind of thing. And maybe it's like air actuated tubes that are yeah. on a, a, rail, <laughs> a rail system, right? Uh, you know, some way, like you, you can scope that in different ways. You know, trying yes. to get Ricci to do juggling would be Very insane. Hard. The servos are just not, they're not, not it's capable. not made for that. Yeah. Yeah. And so you do have to, and part of that I think is where uh, the scoping of things is actually a really interesting problem because mm -hmm. you don't, you don't know how to get to the end of the thing. You, you you want to try to say, this is the thing I want to go do. This is you know what I might need along the way. But mm -hmm. that's the one thing that you can't do on your your own easily, right? That's why you need to join Definitely. a cohort with mentors because a mentor will say, hey, you know, don't waste your time using these servos for mm -hmm. a juggling robot. And then you've just wasted six months of your life trying to get this robot to juggle, yeah. right? And so that's why you know our programs are be like you know. We have mentors and we have advisors to say, hey, this is feasible. Um, this is, you know, why don't we start here? Why don't we scope this in this way? Uh, um, you know, because people come to us for our individualized program saying, hey, I want to make, you know, we had another person come in and be like, I want a, uh, a trash collecting robot, you know, is what I'd like to make. It's like mm -hmm. I'd like it to be a, a robot on wheels with an arm that picks up trash and puts mm -hmm. it in there. And this is their first project that they had never done robotics before yeah right and it's a bit so you have to have an expert yeah. to, to like say well okay you need a full base that can put around at least 25 pounds right uh of like weight plus the weight of its own robot and then if you're going to build some type of an extension arm system you have to be able, it has to be able to deal with the, the mechanical torsion and the the, ex, the reach and the, the counterbalance and then you have to be able to carry all of that like that is not a it's not a first prime first robot yeah right? for sure and so you say okay well like what could we start off first maybe we could put a trash can on a mobile base and put a speaker and ask people to help uh -huh. right? i like that yeah <laughs> right but there's a trash can robot. And it's like, can you put a little mobile base and then we can buy, you know, really cheap, cheap motors and cheap things and, and yeah. a little speaker and then be like, hey, can you help me pick this up? And now <laughs> you've just created a robot. It's like, so being creative with that scoping also allows people to choose the project that is right for them. And that's yeah. kind of the first thing you do. If you're not joining a team program where the project's kind of already scoped out, our individualized program is you come and you talk to our advisor and then we help choose a project for you that will achieve your learning goals. Yep. So if you're where, do you want to learn ROS? Do you want to learn motor control? Do you want to learn, you know, what are the parts of the robotics you want to learn first? Right? Yeah. And then we kind of scope that project for where people are at and their budgets too. You know, it's like, it's like, mm. yes, I want to build an autonomous car. Like okay, can you do you have a car that's already got all the sensors <laughs> and like 
do we need to buy that, yeah. right? So, I mean, all of those things come into a, account. It's why robotics is so challenging, but mm -hmm. a, a community of programs where we can support those components and the expenses, like on a team project, where, you know, Ricci is, was about $6,000 worth of parts, right? Yeah. So, you know, then that becomes amortized and everyone can work on it and make something really cool. Ah. So one thing that strikes me with this, um, it seems like, so it seems absolutely wonderful. Like what a, what an absolutely great way for people to learn. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, I'm thinking about how it would scale because one mm -hmm. thing that it strikes me about, or it strikes me about it is that, um, you really need a knowledgeable, engaged instructor or mentor. I suppose, like mm -hmm. someone to facilitate this whole process. What do you call them? Because mm -hmm. they're not, they're not exactly, maybe they're mentor. So, you know, advisor is an easy advisor. way to do that. But we actually created a, we create a system so mm -hmm. that um, the mentors and, and advisors can help run the, help run the sessions. Yeah. Right. And those sessions are led. They're very structured in like the, what, what you do, you know, you have a, like our team session, we have a project management, like you know, Monday we do our project management. We talk about all the things that were done. Uh, yep. We follow kind of a scrum platform. So we divide, we, we choose our sprint. Um, <laughs> we get all yep. of the things together and someone kind of runs that. And we've played around with um, actually different people running that each time. Oh, um, I like that. Which is, is also really helpful. And so among the that students takes or... among the students. Yeah. Oh, wow. So the students often run the sessions, right? And then we have collaborative work sessions where everybody's working together. Um, and then we have like a show and tell day where people are actually, um, they, they show what their work is, they get feedback from mentors uh, and, and all of that kind of stuff. And huh. you know, what's often, what's amazing is as though that like it's with mentorship, everyone thinks like, oh, I gotta have that really, really highly um, it is what successful person or intelligent person to run all of those meetings and all of that stuff. Um, and the, the structure helps with a lot of that. And then peers, because a lot of the expertise comes from mostly from their peers, because wow. again, everyone's an expert in something right? yeah. and the mentors spend less time. Um, and they also don't teach like mentors don't lecture. There's they no don't lectures. want anyone yes. lecture. So we, we train our mentors to simply say, um, to help them find the thing that they need, the next step, mm -hmm. right? Because in a world where you can learn anything on the internet, it's true. anything. It's not, you know, where will you get the information from? I must have the person in the information in their head. Mm -hmm. It's how you find that information becomes the real challenge, right? Yeah. And mentors become less the, the purveyors of information and more the, the guides along your own path for you finding the information. Yeah. It's like, you know, I, I think of, um, my exploration of, um, you know, I've been building uh, an espresso machine on my, my side. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm in middle, like I'm in the middle robotics area. Like I'm an advisor and we have technical mentors, but I'm also yep. love, I have a, a passion about it as well. And I'm not an expert in any one thing. Right. Mm -hmm. So I was learning, uh, some basic, uh, like learning to do basic electronics, really. I've done CAD, I've done maker stuff, but I've never really done basic electronic stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I was learning the the beginnings of putting a, a whole bunch of sensors in my espresso machine, because I'm also a, a coffee nerd. Awesome. And, and I was working on learning how to build a PCB and, mm -hmm. um, and how to wire this all together. And I was like, well, so, and I ran across this problem that like microcontrollers take have logic voltage and power supplies aren't often different than that about it. So mm -hmm. like, um, but I was like, so do I need a step down converter? How do I get the signal from my sensor to the voltage and still keep the signal going? And I just had, I was like, how do you search for that? If you don't even know what you're searching for, right? Yeah, for Obviously sure. we had somebody with more electronics experience, like, no, what you need to look, it's explore voltage divider and then a bi-directional mm -hmm. voltage divider. And it's that circuit. And I was like, oh, great. They gave me the jargon that I could go Google And you go find and it. And then I could yeah. learn it myself, right? They didn't need to sit there and explain voltage dividers for me. I don't need yep. that. And and it, so what it does is it, it puts less, like 
previously when you talked about how do you incentivize and, um, other entrepreneurs to be mentors, is, is if you take this impetus that they have to explain everything and do everything for the students, that instead all they really have to be available is just like, hey, have you explored the concept of a voltage divider? Have you explored the concept of, you know, uh, the you know, Ohm's law? Like, what is, what is this? <laughs> this is kind of the thing you need next. And then yes. the student goes, looks it up, implements it, Figures and then when they out. have a problem, Come they back. get that. And so that's where the change in things. And, and in fact, our mentors, we're not looking for people who are experts in everything. Mm -hmm. What I'd much rather have in mentors and teach students how to do is to, be, to learn how to learn. Mm -hmm. right? Our best mentors are people who probably could learn the thing that the students were doing the day before, mm -hmm. right? Like, oh, you're, you're, you know, we don't get experts in everything. There is no expert in everything with robotics, right? Mm -hmm. So instead, I'd much rather have somebody who can look up and say, like, well, I've, I've got the basics of Ross down. I've done a little bit with machine learning and, and computer vision. But I bet you we could probably figure out how to integrate a point cloud and be able to get a depth map and be able yeah, to totally. create a, on a, that kind of, of thing, huh. right? You don't have to have someone as that, but a mentor would be able to help lead the students. And then they do it with them. And then they all learn together. Um, and that's kind of where I feel like I, I'm, I, I guess I'd be considered a mentor also because I'm also often in my groups helping and, and yeah. learning that, you know. Um, but that's the, the real change in it. And it, it takes a, a, a thought change, a paradigm shift in this, like, I'm going to sit here and wait until someone teaches me exactly what I need. Yep. Right? That's where what education has taught us, like traditional education has taught yeah. us. Like we just have to take the class to get the thing that we eventually, someone's telling us what we need. Yeah, it's very passive instead, in a sense. Yeah, instead it's active. You say, this is the project I'm making. What do mm -hmm. I need? Oh, uh, it's run, you know, it's, it's computer language. It's got a, you know, it, it's run in Linux. And, oh, guess what? I can control it with Python. I guess I should go take a weekend course in Python, crash course it, and then write a ROS node, right? Yeah. And that that's kind of, and then, I mean, that's kind of how I learned Python was just like, hey, this robot was cool. It ran on Python. <laughs> I guess I should learn that. But I had yeah. not been incentivized to learn it in my entire life because I was like, well, why? I don't yes. like websites. I don't want to run write another website. I've got HTML. That's fine. I don't want to write back. Yeah. Right? <laughs> okay. Now I'm like, ooh, he does cool things. I want to learn Python. And yep. it's the same kind of thing with project learning where we've been, you know, and I'm sure everyone who's listening to this has done this in their life. This is like they've worked on a project. They haven't known something, so they had to go learn it. Mm -hmm. And if you have that project, like if you're working with robot arms, you know, the linear algebra with, for inverse kinematics and all of that stuff that's a thing you need to kind of know a lot of times. And so I, that was something that, you know, all of a sudden we had everybody like looking up and learning, doing, doing like linear algebra <laughs> projects on yeah. the side because they wanted to, to, to learn those things. That's and, very cool. you know, so we believe that instead of going starting from A to Z and trying to start with all the foundational you ever, you ever need, and then you will immediately forget and have to relearn anyway. Yeah, totally. We just say, Hey, when you get to the point that you need this, you learn will it. be incentivized to learn it. And then all of the foundational knowledge that you need will start coming in and you'll be incentivized when you're actually using it. It's mm -hmm. a different way. People are, you know, they're not, they're not these experts in fields. They're people who got a little bit of everything and can probably figure it out along the way. Yeah, I really like that. It's, it's kind of, a, it's a flip in the whole thinking about how to learn and how to structure groups to do things, which yep. I really like. It's like um, you put people to work where they're motivated because they think it's interesting. Um, and you have them in this group where they can ask questions and they can contribute where they want. Yep. And so because of that, the mentor is really just the person that gets them unstuck yes. occasionally. Yep. Um, and that's really low overhead for the mentor. You just need someone who's like good at thinking to yep. be the mentor. I really like that. It's a, it seems like a great structure. It's, it's like a stable structure for a team to do a productive, do, do something and learn a lot. That seems yeah. great to me. Yeah. And it, it, it creates a real interesting thing with like, you know, everybody hated group projects. I know I did in, in school. Right. Mm -hmm. And it, it was because the whole power structure and the, the way that you were doing things were was really flawed, 
You know, it was like, okay, you guys all don't want to do this thing. And I'm all going to make you do this thing. And I'm going to yeah. put you to a bunch of people also who don't want to do this thing. And <laughs> what's the easiest way out is you give the person you think that will know, like who won't say no and who doesn't want a the bad grade work. on it. You force them yeah. to do all the work, right? It's this horrible, like social experiment. that Bad incentive that structure, for sure. Incentive structure, right? Where instead yeah. our groups, people, they come in and it's like, well, you get to work on the thing you actually want to learn, which mm -hmm. is great. And then you become motivating, you, motivating, you do a lot of work. And if, if there's literally no one that wants to work on something, right, then we figure it out. Either, you know, everybody gets Let's together go. and they do this one, they, that thing to get over the hump, right? Yeah. And we all agree to it. Um, or, you know, you rescope it. Like, why does a robot have to have two arms? Yeah. <laughs> I don't, it doesn't. You know, and we, we just bought all the parts. And so I was like, well, fine, if you guys, you know, you guys don't need a second arm, but I, well, I bought all the parts, so I'll build it for you and, <laughs> yeah. and make it happen. And they were more interested in the software and the, um, you know, the control systems rather than the actual hardware at that point. So mm -hmm. they weren't forced to do it. And that's really a crucial part is, is there is no, like, it, it can be flexible. A project is flexible and it can be developed in a way that everybody's efforts are working towards a thing that is, is awesome. And then, yeah. then the things that aren't as awesome, you at least are motivated to do them because you understand why they're important. Yeah. I think I was thinking about it just now and it's, um, I was wondering about like the unsexy tasks in mm -hmm. a sense, like yeah. a, as you're saying. And um, what it seems to me is that, so say there's this one critic, cause often uh, the unsexy tasks might be very important. Mm -hmm. um, but people won't want to do them. Maybe it's like developer ops kind of mm -hmm. thing. Um, and so what, what I see is, or what, what I'm thinking is that with this structure, what happens is everyone learns basic skill or everyone learns skills in what they're interested in. And then they get to a point where they're fairly good at what they're like. They've learned a good bit. They're fairly invested in the idea of continuing and then mm -hmm. on their own, maybe then they can go and they can learn some required infrastructure or best practices or whatever it might be. Um, but this has kind of prepared them by giving them enough skill to get somewhere interesting so yeah. that they might eventually go over the unsexy task, go and complete yeah. that one. And because it's a project, right? You know, it's like if the, if the unsexy task is like, you know, a power control system like well nothing is going to run unless you have that right <laughs> yeah. so everybody gets pretty motivated even for the unsexy tasks to when solve that bottleneck. solution when it's a bottleneck and that they won't get uh. there and then and then you're all working collaboratively to split up the tasks that no one wants to do right yeah. and and that that people volunteer and actually help out with that and so, and there's usually somebody who, who is excited about learning that, like it is <laughs> yeah. robotics, it is fun. And somebody understands why, you know, or at worst, there's someone who's really good at it who can hammer it out way quicker than anyone else. Than everyone and, else. Yeah. And then they help other people do that really quick, you know? So all of those things are your tools to, to be able to create a great group and, and actually succeed in a project um, ah. and uh, and learn a whole bunch on the way. But the whole point is, is unlike business where it's you, you everybody has their silos, well, what's really created, and that's a, a bit of a disservice in the robotics industry. What we see is, is a lot of our students are coming, they're you know, automation engineers and QA, it's all sorts of like deep like company, like pro people in larger robotics Very specific companies. specific roles, yeah. But they want to learn roles. something else because they don't have any of opportunity to do that at their work. Because mm -hmm. like the way companies are set up is like you don't give the you know tasks to somebody who's not good at them. You give them to mm -hmm. this person who's really good at them. And then that's all they do, right? But I mean, you know, it, it as a business side of things in my brain, I'm always looking for um, something that somebody might excel at that they don't currently do, right? Huh. Because then you get happier, better employees that are are learning more things, rather than giving only the things that are to the people who are good at. Like you, 
we get excited about learning. We want to grow. And oh, so totally. if I keep my employees doing new things and what what else might they be good at that they're not doing right now, then they grow into new positions and, and stuff. And it's the same thing, you know, with with this group. But if it, but when you have a lot of people coming from some of these other other companies that aren't doing that, they're hungry to learn all the new stuff. And we wanna we wanna mm -hmm. give them that opportunity to 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 learn the things that they're not good at. What do you think would happen if, so I, I understand from a company's perspective, the desire to specialize yeah. people and have them do the thing because they're going to be really good at it. And mm -hmm. um, also, you can kind of pay them like the minimum amount because the majority of their time is on the most specialized, highest value added thing. Whereas if you pay them to learn about something that's irrelevant to whatever it is that they're most specialized on, mm -hmm. you could think of it as lost time. But as you're saying, Maybe it's uh, they're pivoting into a thing that they're really good at, but very and very happy to do. Yep. But I don't. I just what, what would you think if companies were to adopt this approach, where maybe like I don't know, there's some things where it's like twenty percent of your time is your own yep. um, for side projects or something. But what what would a company look like that did this, and what do you think the outcome would be? Well, I think that you know, as a side thing, like we have a whole enterprise side that we would love to be able to do and have people doing that and it's like that's a really yeah. easy way that they can provide that for their student or for their their employees be like hey you guys want to learn to get trained on a whole bunch of other stuff that has nothing <laughs> to do with it like let's put you through mech labs and then oh. you not only are going to gain a lot of experience be able to help um and, and really pull this back to your teams a new a new way of thinking so that is something we we want to provide for companies and enterprise as as well um, cool. But I do I think didn't realize that, that business model. Yeah, I mean, but I do think that that's like companies getting someone very specialized is is it's important for for speed and 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 effectiveness, right? Because obviously, you know, if you want to build something and get it to market, you do need to be really fast, and and the fastest way to do that is get a whole bunch of people who already know how to do it. But no one mm -hmm. truly knows how to do it if, if we're actually working on good technology right it's it's all new no one's done it before if it's exciting cool stuff and so mm -hmm. it, what we want to do is, is we want to foster the the I, and we want to foster companies who realize that it's not what the skills that people know that will make them mm -hmm. successful it's how well that they they can learn right mm -hmm. and that's like that metric is just something that you know we really have to train our companies to look for and we have to train our our people to be able to demonstrate, and and that's what, it's a what new metric thing. explicitly. How 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 easy like how quickly you can learn to learn. Oh yeah, definitely. I think it's so valuable, right? For sure. And it's something. That, and by keeping that muscle strong, it yeah. seems so valuable. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and because you want somebody who can figure things out and and learn how to learn a new skill yet if you put them doing the same thing all the time just that they're good at then they aren't as good at learning mm -hmm. and you know you get your job done but you don't like succeed if that job changes yeah and i think also yeah. over time if people are not engaged in their work they start yeah. slowly falling behind because they were really specialized once but the job's responsibilities are a moving target and they're moving away from their core competences yeah. So I don't you, know about you, you have to. If if I'm not learning something new and like growing in in something that I'm doing in some way, mm -hmm. I get really bored with it and I leave. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. That's why I've been a you know I, I've been a weird employee to hire in many ways because I wear I do so <laughs> many things and I wear so many hats. Like my resume yeah. is bizarre looking, right? You know, it's <laughs> like a, I, have a, I have a degree in ethnobotany and I do robotics now. You know, it's yeah. this. It's like what? But I know, and and so basically, I just created a, a, a like an education program that can justify the way that I like to learn. <laughs> That's really what we've done. Oh, yeah. just be like, you know, I I'm good at learning things, and I can get mm -hmm. to that like eighty percent of of competency really quickly. Pretty quick, you know. Yeah. Um, and so I wanted to be able to help people who are interested in not only that, like learning that last top 20%, but also the people who want to get up to that 80, that first 80% quickly. And, yep. you know, and realizing robotics is something that's changing so quick. And like the, in the last five years, the availability of hardware that at a low price point that you can start building at has just exploded. 
right? Yeah. I mean, think of all of the like, you know, it's like right now we're getting little, um, the like the itsy bitsy and the feathers and the, you know, all of the cool stuff from out of fruit, the microcontrollers that not only now use, um, you know, Arduino and C, but they also, you could do circuit Python. And so basically hmm. you can take a weekend workshop, learn cool. Python, you can, you can take a, a microcontroller and use that Python on it, you know, and then mm -hmm. in a very short time, you can be writing, you know, doing robotics, embedded code, embedded yeah. code and making sensors work and building this stuff for, you know, so cool, you know, so much less than what we used to have to pay oh, yeah. to get into robotics, right? You don't have to have a platform uh -huh. like Ricci to understand robotics anymore. Like you could, there's so much more. Remember when bait, like if you wanted to make a robot, just a simple base with a couple wheels and I think it was, was hundreds painful. of dollars, you know, mm -hmm. and now you can, you know, it, obviously you get what you pay for, but you can, you can, you can buy a $30 kit on Amazon and have a base of a robot that you can put a yep. Raspberry Pi on and put Ross on and then to meet, then put a camera on and, you know, under $150, you could actually be having a, a full like Ross implemented computer vision robot. Oh, totally. Yeah, right. I know. I just um, I just spoke with um, Afrez from Mangdang, who does the Spot Mini lo mm -hmm. looking robot, uh, Mini yep. Pupper, mm -hmm. and um, like that's a quadruped for five hundred dollars that has pretty sophisticated sensors and a Raspberry Pi. Like that's so cool. Yep. That's totally new. Like buying a quadruped at a, an affordable price. Exactly. Like unbelievable. Yeah, um, it's like, and you're right. Yeah, the explosion of hardware. It's moving so fast, right? And right mm -hmm. now is the time to get you know deeper in robotics or learn other things in robotics huh. because it's so much like the availability to learn this stuff is finally to anyone. You don't have to be you know a researcher, you know, with yes. a million dollar lab to learn <laughs> you know inverse kinematics with with arms. You, you know, mm -hmm. you can 3D print it with a few few uh, stepper motors, and uh, you know you could be learning it for for less than than a hundred dollars. Yeah, it's nuts. Um, going back to thinking about corporations or yeah. like larger businesses and having them do something similar to mm -hmm. your courses. Um, one one thing, one challenge that I could imagine is that um, if the people don't want to be there, because you have, it's sort of a biased group that comes mm -hmm. to you for these courses where they're yeah. all really engaged and very excited to do it for themselves. Like they're literally wow. paying their own money to spend their time learning yeah. and working with you on some yeah. projects. How, how do you imagine it would, I, I don't, just what do you think about the idea of people having their company send them to this kind of time um, where they would work on something in line with the projects we've been discussing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, the, the part of it is, is that, you know, as we have to make it fun, we have to make mm -hmm. it interesting. That's kind of the part is, and that's scoping those projects, right? Yep. So for team projects, you know, we do have to make a fun and interesting project that people are going to be excited about, right? If mm -hmm. someone really doesn't want to be there, like, we can also, they can just sit in the corner and read their phone if they want. Like, I'm not, I'm <laughs> not don't stopping. Care. I don't, yeah. like, if they want to con contribute, they can. And the way our programs are is, is no one's relying on, like, the fifth person who's reading his phone to get the yep. job done, right? You know, and so we did a program just yesterday for um, uh, a Brazilian innovation tour company that that brought in uh, about 30, 30 students uh, all of different corporate backgrounds who had not mm -hmm. the, no robotics experience per se, and wow. we brought them in, um, set them down on a little platform, which is a I don't know if you've seen their Palulo Zumo bots. They are one hundred and fifty nine dollars. Oh, yep, use them as like a sumo thing. Yeah, and they're like little like, sumo would... bots, but they have an IMU. They have proximity sensors. They have yep. line following. They have um, they have all of these things, and yep. an example library. And so we basically set them up. I, I made a quick tutorial on the, you know, on our wiki, and I said, you know, this is you guys are going to figure this out. So you're going to learn how to connect the robot. You're going to learn how to install your IDE. You're going to learn how to um, to load it up and understand the, all the 
the things that you want to pull your hair out with Arduinos and like, you know, <laughs> how do I get the COM yeah. port? Where do I find the library? And so yeah. we made some of the tutorial to make that easier, but we put them through the paces and then let them explore all the examples. And we said, hey, there might be a fighting robot example in yeah. there somewhere. See if you can figure it out. And ah. they all did, and then we let them decorate the robots, and then uh, and then we had a big so tournament of, of of battling you know bots, and so these you know, and they got a chance if they wanted to get into the code and learn a little bit of coding, they could do that. If they wanted to play mm -hmm. around you know with the hardware, like they could do that. And so that that's really the thing is just to like, you know, aim it at wherever. You know, we're not going to get them into the, you know, the the deep math and deep coding of stuff if it's if that's not where where they need to be. But mm -hmm. having a cool product, like if you, if our our Bible is the project. You you know, yep. build it to learn it. If you get a good project, there will be something there that will interest most people. And if it really doesn't interest them at all, it doesn't Don't hurt do them it. to be on their phone over there or yeah. to, to help in any way that they do. Like we often, we, we occasionally have students that um, that fall off the, you know, fall off the beaten path a little bit. And so they, we have to pull them back in or they don't contribute as much. But yeah. the way it works is they get what they need and what they put in out of it. Oh, definitely. Uh, let's see. So you were speaking about tutorials over uh, earlier. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a bit about having students? Because it sounds like it's one of the like few things that you're taking more of an active stance and encouraging mm -hmm. students to do in the program. Would you tell yeah. me a bit about that? Sure. So a lot of it is, is like understanding account, the, the process of accountability, right? With a project based program, the, the big question is like, well, why don't I just do it myself? Right. And you know, rightly so if, if that's like, we want you to learn it yourself and we want you to grow those things like that and mm -hmm. a lot of people can but we also want to offer the points for like a when you get stuck you have mentors and you have people who can help you right and that's mm -hmm. what you don't have doing a product on your own and we all get stuck right mm -hmm. the other side of it is is the you need some kind of structure of accountability right we all know that we well, there's no way that we're going to continue going to the gym if we if it were a pay by the day kind of thing, right? <laughs> the the fact that we've paid for the month and we have to go to the gym that's the only way that really gets us to go to the gym sometimes, <laughs> right? Yeah, and so funny. you have to create some levels of structures of accountability. And so um, documentation is one of those things that we just found. You know, I, I like to say everybody, but there, I have some people who've been like, I love documentation. That's like good help us with that uh -huh. right because um most people don't do well with writing documentation right mm -hmm. they're great on building stuff but they don't want to document it and so part of the the learning process for you know the, the classic thing is is the uh you know show and demonstrate and then involve the other person into learning like that's the classic way of teaching something right yeah well in this situation where you know it's a little bit flipped, right? You're you're learning it along with them. It's like the the demonstrate and the teach someone else what you're learning is part of that documentation process. All of those put together creates accountability. It creates a um, ability for people to in, ingrain what they've learned because they have to explain it, and then it's yep. documented so that when other people need that information, it can be there uh, as well as when we need that information, you know, they, they say documentation is a love letter to your future self. Yeah, um, definitely. It, it is, and so it's super important. And so we, that's, that's one of those unsexy things that we, you know, we, we require people to do. Um, and and so that that's just one really important thing we've found that really helps on so many levels that we want to make sure that it's, a, it, it's part of every single person's like kind of requirements to that. Mm -hmm. Are there any other requirements that you have or is that really like, I mean, you show up at certain times and you have like, these are the hours we'll be all together. But yeah. um, other than that, is there any real hard structure in the whole program? Well, there's a lot of structure, but requirements like the, yeah. we don't have any, any other requirements. Any, we don't have any um, like 
you know, school is filled with prerequisites, right? You can't take this yeah. unless you've taken this and you can't take this. <laughs> and, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I opened right up to the back page of the manual, but like, I want to take all of that. Like, I, I really, yep, all totally. the four or 500 classes, that's what I want to take. Those are oh, the more gotta, interesting ones. Yeah. Like, why do I have to take intro to computers? Like, really? <laughs> Like I, yeah. I've been using computers, thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah. And like, so we realize like there are no prerequisites. We do for our team programs. We do choose people that have. We need to have one skill in That's strong the team that not even strong, but you need to have a, like a, you a competence. You have to have some competency in one of the fields that is needed to complete this project. Right. Ah. And so, and again, you don't even have to do those things, but we do but want your expertise resource. and your resource for the group. And so we try mm -hmm. to match people in that. And if there's really truly a spot that has no competency in that area, that's where we'll bring a mentor in to be able to help Makes with sense. That, that there. Yeah. Right? Um, and so for our team levels, it's the, our one requirement is that you have some competency in some level of that. And we can be pretty loose with that. If you're a maker and you've done a lot of CAD to be 3D printed, but you've never done anything professionally or you know, you've never done a bunch of other things with it, that's still really valuable because we find that you've learned that thing. It's that like, what did you get expertise in? We just want you to have some expertise in something so that yeah. we know that you you can, can do that. And that helps... Um, with the team project. For the individualized project, there are no requirements. You can come in as green as you could possibly be. Okay? Mm -hmm. And it's really amazing because you do see, you know, it's not just the people who are, you know, experts getting other people. Like, there are so many things that this person, for example, that person who's really green in robotics has really good business sense. And this other person <laughs> who's, a, who's an electrical engineer is now learning about basic marketing for the very first time. And <laughs> you can contribute to their basic marketing, right? Like, yeah. And that ends up being still really valuable because of this community thing. So um, we we just kind of say, forget the prerequisites. Um, you know, Most people have some level of, of something there and then they can join. And, or we can help put them into a group. Maybe you, you're not jumping into the deep um, object orientation and grasping class, you're working on the mini, you know, DIY pup, you know, mini pupper where you're, you know, just working with Raspberry Pi and then some of those yep. things. So, you know, it's, it's about scoping the people for the pro or matching the people for the project too. That's that, but mm -hmm. we don't, other requirements is just, you know, you, you need to show up at sessions. Um, yep. but we also have a really cool way of doing an asynchronous thing. So we haven't even talked about how, this whole, like you, you actually asked earlier, how do you scale this? And I don't think mm -hmm. we got to that, right? Not yet. Um, Definitely the, want to talk about it. You could do it now. Yeah. yeah. The scaling <laughs> is uh, that this is all a hybrid model. Not mm -hmm. only can you be in person, but you can do this completely remote, right? That's awesome. And so that's how we scale a lot of this group. And we found, so it can be literally double the amount of students because we can do half in person and half out, you know, being uh, completely virtual. And then even so, our facility-wise of this, even our students who are in person, they don't need to be here doing things all the, the whole time. time. If yeah. we're having a meeting, like if we're having a Zoom meeting, there's no point in us all being in, a, in one room and, and saying, like, they can all be home and, like, you know, in their, their, their bathrobe doing, yep. a, doing a, a project planning, project, Perfect. you know. And some <laughs> people might come into the lab um, and so that's how we really scale this is that you create a hands-on experience even if you don't have an experience. You know? And mm -hmm. I'd, I'd like to tell this quick story about For sure. um, uh, Noel, who is one of our Argentinian students. He lived in Argentina, and he was an automations engineer, but he had never done CAD, never done any type of CAD design. And, you know, it was like... Like this is something I want to learn, but I've just again. He's like, well, do I go back to school for this? Do I take a course to learn how to use basics? I've never had anything fun to make, right? Mm -hmm. And so now we're like, hey. So the the neck piece of this was originally scoped with um, the Pollen Robotics as this really fascinating but very intricate mechanism where it was a three degree of freedom um, system that huh. was called the Orbita. It was really cool. It was a little outside of what we were going to build and recreate. So we just put a pan tilt servo in there. But all of this had been designed, and so we needed to actually design the mounting of those servos 
into the program. So we needed somebody to cat up the whole structural mechanism to hold that. And so he was like, oh, I'd love to learn CAD. So I literally went on a, you know, a call with him, spent 20 minutes to be like, here, this is how you set up your components and your, you know, your, your components and your uh, parts in Fusion 360 so that you can be successful. Here's how you turn on your device, you know, your, your actual uh, changes history so that you can get back to things. And here's mm -hmm. like two other tips. Here are the models for the servos that you yep. can put in, and this is how you put them in. And now I want you to build this, right? Yeah. And I gave him kind of the specs of what, what we want here, the measurements, there's that. He, mm -hmm. you know, he went home and by the very next night had built something. And mm -hmm. so he put it on our 3D printers over the air. And so it was literally printing out in the morning when I came in. I came in, I hand it to the team, they assemble it for him, they give him notes. He goes back uh -huh. and redesigns re it. And it's yep. like, he's hands-on catting and 3D printing. He's just not necessarily touching the thing, right? Mm -hmm. Which is incredible. So he basically learned to CAD better than most of us in two weeks. That's awesome. Right? And mm -hmm. made, managed to do all the things that we needed. And so that's kind of the process is like, you know, you have something cool that you need, somebody who wants to learn it. And even if they're completely virtual, you know, they can buy, you know, uh, a cheaper robotist servo and a control module and then start working on the code to control that and understanding it even hands on at their desk, that then that code can go and be uploaded into our project and work in a much bigger system. So you, yeah. can, you can kind of on a micro level do quite a bit hands on, even if you're not in our lab yet. Mm -hmm. Then and most of our programming, like a lot of our uh, programmers that were mostly interested in just doing the code for the robot. They didn't even come into the lab. They were working yeah. with everybody, but we'd have them up on the big screen and like, <laughs> talking to them, and they would be uploading code and controlling the robot from their home. That's so cool. Right? And being able to test this while we are all working on this, you know, it, it becomes uh, like we aren't limited anymore to an in-classroom, in you know, experience. The, yeah. the pandemic has taught, like this was developed during our pandemic because... We, we were like, well, we can't wait. We need to create this amazing program for people now. And mm. the pandemic showed us just how well we can be able to, to do that and what the limitations are as well. But yeah. it allows us to create a system where we can scale this um, and the actual in you can be hands on without necessarily having to be in a school nine to five every single day. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's so interesting. To me, it seems like um, the whole approach that you're taking in this, um, how, how do you call it again? Mechie? Or what's Mech Labs. The, Mech Labs. The yep. whole approach you're taking in the Mech Labs course um, or program, um, it seems like I'm comparing it in my head to like universities or mm -hmm. these kinds of things where it seems like they go against a lot of, so for example, people have to take courses they're not motivated to do. You have yep. to learn things that are kind of abstract and mm -hmm. not directly applicable to what you're working on or what you're even interested in, but it's like A to Z learning, as you were yeah. saying. Yep. Um, they have rigorous measures in place for accountability, like all the exams and things like this and the, the like hierarchy that forms from all of that. Yep. Um, whereas you guys, and also then they have, they have the high paid lecturers relatively. Yep. Um, they have the intricate infrastructure around like TAs and graders and all of this kind of thing. Multi-million dollar labs that very few people can access it when they yeah, need. that's totally true, too um, And so you guys kind of took everything and you flipped it on its head yep. And so it's like people are motivated to do whatever it is mm -hmm. um, You need very little of an experts time. Those are your advisors and mentors um, The people it's like if they want to disengage that's totally fine But mm -hmm. for the most part they're doing it because they're totally interested in it. Yep um, it's very interesting. And then the accountability with documentation, providing it so that it's good for them in the future, it's good for you to build off of their work, yep. and it's helping them kind of skill up in how they communicate and also in their own understanding by leveraging the idea that they um, teach to learn because they are writing documentation, teaching it to their future selves or whoever their reader may be, readers yep. may be. It, it feels very clever to me. Um, with all of this. It's like you're working with the grain of human nature very well, um, wow. as opposed to other structures. 
is how I'm thinking of it now. Well, thank Very you. Cool. Yeah, it's, a, it, it's <laughs> like we we develop something that we wanted to learn from, and yep. how we've kind of learned these things, right? And so it's that's been modeled on that. And then you know we put it to test. We got groups of people. We we built this stuff mm -hmm. and and said, hey, this is where and you're refining over works. time. And we're refining. All of this is a giant experiment as well, and we're going to continue to to grow. One of the yep. things we hope to do is uh, micro credentialing with like NFT badges, mm -hmm. where you are actually <laughs> you, you own your certificate and you can demonstrate value along with, you know, we can say, hey, you know, you want to get a badge in uh, um, motor control theory, right? Yeah. Your project is right in there. All you have to do is, is maybe hit a few of these other kind of things and demonstrate that in your project yep. and you will earn this badge. And then you can put that on your LinkedIn and your resume and everything else, right? Yeah. Other stuff that we hope is, is that we'd like to, to create even a reward structure structure based around a, a crypto coin where you can be oh. able somewhat like a miles program, you you know, you're in a in a program and you're you're actually learning and you get rewarded by a crypto token. And then as you go through there, you're actually being able to find like earn your way through your program. And and you know, if it ever becomes successful and worth something, maybe that crypto pays for your entire education itself just by you learning, right? That would be super cool. And we cool. get to throw everything up into the air and say, "Hey, we've just ra radicalized all of this education system by uh -huh. you know there." And if it's worth nothing, at least you get an education. So yeah, <laughs> and you guys had fun making a cryptocurrency. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so like, there's there's a lot of really interesting things that we hope will come down the pipeline as we as we build this and and experiment with it. And we're excited to have people who come and and be part of this uh, journey with us. What do you think is the role of typical like, I mean, I guess K through twelve education, but then um, university education, and like. And how, how does all that relate to this? Uh, can it supplement it? Is it meant to be torn down by this? Is, yeah. is it, like, where, where does it all fit? I think it can fit both. I mean, you know, right now I would say that it's a great supplement to, mm -hmm. you know, uh, an engineering degree to get actual hands-on experience in portfolio projects, um, mm -hmm. electronics degree. I mean, any of those degrees you can, you will gain by joining a program like this. We, you know, we have aspirations in 10 years to maybe make actual universities just not as relevant, you know, relevant. I mean, who knows? Maybe we can do it. Um, yeah. <laughs> like we'd like to. That's what we're shooting for. I mean, you know, how, we see a problem and we think that our, our solution can do a lot for things. Um, mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that we're also just because I say that it doesn't mean that we're not open to like, hey, you know, you, you're in a, we can partnership with universities. We can partnership with yeah. programs and boot camps. And, you know, if you're learning an embed, embedded programming boot camp, right, we can be able to provide the hardware and the projects that you could actually cut your teeth on even virtually. Right. And, and yeah. so, that, you know, all of those things can be possible. And so the there's a lot of opportunity for us to create good partnerships and work with organizations as for you know we're focused mostly on you know 16 to 18 year olds and up we're looking for kind of you know post high school graduate um, mm -hmm. we get a lot of people who are already graduated um, and we keep seeing this like this the sad part is we also see a lot of people who are experts so-called experts we get them literally on paper and we see like wow why are they even taking this course it's like they don't know on anything. paper they're great but you know Time after time, I can't tell you how many masters of mechanical engineering degrees, you know, people that we we come in, and they can't cab their way out of a paper bag. Yep. Right. Like, there are some really basic skills that are not being taught by these programs that mm -hmm. you know, that we need, right? And what they need the most out of anything, regardless of what whether they're good at CADing or not, they need practical projects to learn from. You need, like, you have to do the thing. It, like, we live in a world where you can learn to be an expert woodworker on YouTube. Yeah, right? it's nuts. But unless you actually do the woodworking, you won't be You'll good. Never do it. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, so you can learn to be an expert. You can know all the things. You can collect all the knowledge. Yeah. But you have to do it. And that's that. everything. It's the build it to learn it approach is what we, we think is the, the way of the future. Definitely. Yeah, I had I had a professor 
at some point that w used to say something like, I can watch all the golf on TV, but it doesn't make me any better at golf, this kind of thing. Same with watching and all you, the woodworking videos you on YouTube. You can sit in all kind of the college courses and all, listen to all of the lectures in the world of all the things, but it's not going to make you an expert in those things. The only way you get to be good at these things is actually just doing them and, yeah. and failing at them and, and learning oh, and totally. growing and you know, all of that part of the process. Yeah, I think it's it's really important to me um, to try to build something, and then by trying to build it, you see the limitations, you see where it's difficult, you see um, why you can't do the first thing you wanted to do immediately, and then you start mm -hmm. to think creatively and learn the skills to keep growing. It's a wonderful check on reality, or on yourself oh, yeah. with reality. Yeah. Um, so I, just cutting their teeth on actual projects, it sounds like a wonderful thing for your students. Where, so you mentioned expansion, um, like looking at different areas. Can you tell me a bit about your expansion plans? Um, so right now we are looking to expand more circuit launch locations, expand more labs for mech labs. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of, we've the we're in the middle of a of a funding round that will allow us to to be able to do that. Of course, a lot of because we are dealing with space, there's a lot of like kind of long term planning that has to happen when you open spaces and everything like that. So we are. Um, exploring a lot of things from working with governments to be able to provide economic centers of innovation um, uh -huh. and a lot of you know we're looking at the venture model we're looking at a lot of different stuff to to, to go and so um, there will be you know big things in the future that we're having but we're not quite sure and so right now if you are interested in being part of that future we'd love to uh, to talk to you as an investor or a student or an entrepreneur or a roboticist um, but at the at the moment we you know it's a, it's a giant experiment even to us. We got to figure out what will work and, and where we can uh, can provide value and create you know the change that we want to want to make. Mm -hmm. Let's see. So if people are interested, how should they follow up, or sure. what would the what would the good approach be? Yeah, if you're interested in becoming uh, like an entrepreneur in our in our Bay Area Oakland facility, uh, CircuitLaunch.com. Uh, as we open up other facilities, hopefully that will be, uh, you know, that'll also be the website until we have them. Uh, right now, it's just the Oakland facility. Um, and if you are interested in learning, um, learning robotics or you know, building some of these cool things, uh, MechLabs.ai is the best way to uh, to come and and find us and and get in contact, to see what what projects are there and uh, and and build. We've got some some really fun stuff up on the, uh, um, you know, on the horizon. All right. Well, that's all we have time for. Thank you, Dan. Well, thank you. All right. Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Dan O'Mara. Thank you again to our founding sponsor, Open Robotics. See you next time.